The fact of the matter is, whether you've been in network marketing for years or just a few days, your family and friends have seen your opportunity and your phone is, as we call it, burnt. If you're anything like me, that's a scary thought. So the big question is, how do entrepreneurs like us, who love the network marketing profession, who no longer want to be that guy and are tired of convincing people during uncomfortable let's get coffee meetings where they say, what's this all about? How do we market in a way that aligns us with our dream clients and expands our network of upfront and transparent professionals, allowing us to get our time back, our families back, and gain a real passive asset? People like us who value impact over income, we deserve to see our visions once and for all. Join me in this podcast where we'll uncover just how to do that. My name is Eric Sablon. Welcome to Burnt Phone Marketing. What's going on, guys? Eric Sablon here with Burnt Phone Marketing. And I, you know, I'm from Alaska. I was born and raised in Alaska. And I've never really, like, done an Alaskan section. So this time of year, March, the beginning of the year, um, we just had something called Ferrandi in Alaska. If you've never heard of that, it's where they did Rod Dingo's, the last great race, because we're one of the greatest states. So I actually found a couple of my good friends that are in marketing, that are in sales, that for the next couple of weeks, we're going to highlight some Alaskans, the Highlight Alaskan series on Burnt Phone Marketing Radio. So today I'm going to talk to a guy that we're really, really close friends. I mean, we've, we've done some long drives to Kenai. We just talk marketing. We talk all sorts of things. And I, the other day I was like, you know what? It would be awesome to have this guy on my podcast. He's a phenomenal marketer. He's an amazing communicator. He's a dad, a husband. He's owned multiple businesses. He's owned a couple of marketing plans. And one of the really cool things is just recently with the pandemic going on, he created another business and won something called the Gold Pan Award from the Chamber of Commerce in, in Anchorage, Alaska. So super big deal. You don't just get that being any business. And he literally was up against some really, really good businesses. And, uh, you know, he won it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and what that's done and how that's changed his business. But, you know, Please welcome my good friend, my like, uh, we bounce ideas off each other. Honestly, guys, if you've seen a new idea, I probably reached out to this guy and been like, what do you think about this? And he's like, dude, don't do that. And I'm like, I'm going to try it. And he's like, no, 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 don't do it. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to try it. And he's like, don't do it. And I'm like, all right, fine. I won't do it. So please welcome my good friend, kind of my mentor, the guy that I bounce stuff off of marketing and my good buddy, Jeff Gallagher to the show. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Eric. Excited to be here. Yeah. So real quick, like just a little bit about your backstory. You know, you're a lifelong Alaskan, but a little bit about your backstory and, you know, what you've done in the past couple of years in the marketing and entrepreneur space. Sure. So I was born. No. Um, so uh, really right out of high school, I just thought I wanted to work at a TV station, uh, skip the college route and just started working right away. Uh, it took me a few years to work into sales, but eventually did that and uh, immediately just uh, kind of uh, really enjoyed the marketing sales side of it, talking with people, helping people's businesses. Um, you know, sales always has the uh, used car salesman connotation to it, but I never really found that. Um, I always enjoyed working with my clients uh, and helping their businesses succeed. And that was advertising at the TV station. Um, you know, fast forward through that for a little over a decade and uh, had an opportunity to uh, start out an ad agency myself um, and uh, moved into the digital world as the whole world was moving that way. Uh, and same, same thing. Um, I've had so many clients that I haven't really considered um, salespeople, but we're just working together, partnering to help their business uh, succeed. So uh, in the last number of years, I would say a lot of sweat equity has paid off into uh, some opportunity and um, sweat equity with networking, with partnerships, with uh, different people that um, whether it was friends or uh, business associates started to see um, that sometimes I knew what I was talking about, not all the time, but um, sometimes I knew what I was talking about when it came to marketing and um, kind of some outside sales. And so that opened the door for, uh, like you said, the disinfection company that we were able to start uh, doing some high level consulting uh, right here at Body Renew um, and uh, working with some other clients. So that, 
so you started right out of high school. Like you didn't go to college. You didn't take the college route. Um, smart guy. But what was the transition like when you went from like, what was your transition from like when you were inside like the, the studio or inside the TV station? How did you get that break to go into sales? And then I'm going to, I have a follow-up question uh, on that one after that. Yeah. So, um, Honestly, I thought I was going to be uh, the next sports center anchor. So I was at, uh, I did a King Career Center here locally in Anchorage, which is an awesome program and uh, thought I was definitely going to be um, the next news anchor. But I went and worked at a station that didn't have any news. And so uh, it was only after a few years doing some admin there that um, I had a few really good sales mentors uh, reach out and say, hey, you should try uh, this path and having no idea about anything and how to sell and how much a commercial costs and all that stuff. I just kind of got dropped in the deep end of the pool. And like I said, it wasn't, uh, um, I just never had that experience where I was like, I don't like this. Like, Oh, I'm call, I'm cold calling or any of that stuff. I mean, those things come up from uh, time to time, but for the most part, when I worked with clients, um, whether it be big ad agencies or direct clients, I always, I always had a really good time. I mean, to this day, which is aging me, but, you know, 15 years later, I still am friends with a lot of the clients that I had, you know, my first few people that I got on the air. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, for a kind of crazy transition of not going to college and not doing all that. It was pretty smooth, actually. That's cool. That's cool. So like you literally were inside the trenches, you were seeing what was going on. You, you started off inside the box and then went into like that, that that's, that's impressive because you don't see that story a lot. And one of the really cool things is like, that's my story too. Cause I skipped the college thing. I was like, I always say yeah. I was a student on a good day. Like I only, yeah. I only showed up for school to play hockey and that was it. So that, that yeah. was the only reason why I actually showed up for school. So fast forward a little bit, like you opened up your marketing agency and you were doing that for a while. What was the transition like? What was the big, like, I, I have a question here. This is what was the misconception um, when it comes to, when it came to digital marketing at the infancy? Because I know you were there at the very, very beginning. You were actually probably yeah. one of the ones that was telling me what was going on. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess um, what was interesting was I, I always said every washed up TV and radio sales rep found one client and called themselves an ad agency and they would try to do everything. And so I, I never wanted to be that. I didn't want to be the guy who was going to design your website that was going to, you know, buy your TV, who was going to come and shoot the commercial, like kind of master of none sort of thing. I never wanted to be in that role. And there were a lot of people out in the community that did that. And so when I had the opportunity, fortunately, I had had a brief experience at a small ad agency. And this is 13, 14, 2013, 2014, where um, I had seen it, it, how a small ad agency could run. In my head, it was always Mad Men, you know, 30 employees and three floors on downtown buildings. And, and, you know, that was an ad agency. And I actually had some friends that owned big agencies here in town. So that was always what I had in my head. Um, and then I went and worked at this small agency and I saw contract work. And this is, I mean, predating too much of like kind of fiber and stuff like that, where now contract work is commonplace and not only commonplace, very easily accessible. There wasn't any of that stuff around. Um, but when I had the opportunity to go out on my own and I just had a, a close friend say, hey, do you think you could do this? And, and that voice started ringing in the back of my head. I'm the washed up TV rep who's going to call myself an ad agency. And then I thought, no, I have uh, a great web developer who used to be my production guy at the TV station. He moved to California. He's literally in Silicon Valley, knows like things before people know them. I had a great copywriter. And so I started to put things together where I was like, I'm not going to have to be the one that tries to log in and build your website or do all this stuff. My background was in TV. And so I knew the market, I thought fairly well, and I was going to really help people navigate TV only to walk into every single client and for them to go, can you run my social media campaign? <laughs> and I, and I didn't even have to sell it. No, no. Can, not only can you run it, can we pay you? Um, okay, okay. Well, I was here to talk to you about TV advertising and you know how I'm the best media buyer in town. So um, I just dove head first, same sort of thing, concept where I learned as much as I could, um, found some really good um, mentor people 
people that I followed online uh, to kind of navigate my way, spent a lot of hours, uh, you know, reading stuff that was over my head so that I made sure that I also could um, come from a place of authority and a little bit of expertise. Um, and so, so, yeah, kind of that's, that was my path to the, the digital side of things. And uh, in that's now where we focus. That's now where my agency focuses. I don't uh, do too much traditional advertising, um, but we focus specifically on uh, digital advertising. And if you've ever been to, to, to Jeff's, one of Jeff's pitches, he is the man to repitch, to throw rocks against uh, old <laughs> paper, uh, TV, like radio. He is the man when it comes- I'm to just old enough. <laughs> <laughs> He's the man when it comes to throwing rocks. Like all of a sudden it's like, boom, this is the reason why that doesn't work. This is the reason why this hasn't worked. This is the reason why that hasn't worked. It's so amazing to kind of, because he's been through the trenches, he's been there. And, you know, one thing that he said that really stuck out to me was, you know, he surrounded himself with the right people. He wasn't the jack of all trades. He basically found the who, like Russell Brunson says, find your who. And then Pedro Adeo says, find a niche so small that you're the only one that fits in it. And that's what he did. And, but he didn't have to learn all the other things. He just surrounded himself with some people that really were good at what they did, kept him in their niche, put him in the right places. Like what's the coach's name for Alabama? He says, put the, put the right people on the bus, put them in yeah. the right seats yeah. and let them know where we're going. So, yeah. and that, yeah. and that's what business is. It's like getting people to buy in and, and, and take you to take, take you to the, to where you're going and where you want to go. Well, and I think there's a certain element to sales and, and marketing um, and running a business in general that's difficult to, uh, and I'm just not one to be like, hey, I'm so good at this. I don't really like that. But that was the best part about having people at my right and left that I knew were the best, that I had um, kind of put through the ringer to make sure that, okay, this is the person I want developing websites. This is the person I want writing my copy. And so then it was easy for me to brag about my business. I mean, I started the agency, but it wasn't like I was out there saying, hey, I'm so awesome. I'm going to be really good at this. I was just able to distill down what, you know, amazing things that Brandon, my web developer would be doing and, you know, would be Greek to me and I knew to the client. And so I would always tell him, tell me like a five-year-old so that I could go back and tell the client, you know, this is what's going on with your web development and stuff like that. And so I really appreciated surrounding myself and knowing through the years, the right people. Um, and when you're talking about specific things like that, like you said, web development or copywriting or, or um, you know, video, all of that stuff. Like what, one of the things that I say after all of the years is, like I've taken the licks. I've also done things a lot of, of a lot of things wrong. You know, it's not some hidden secret. You could Google what I do and you could do it. You're just also going to have to go through the hiccups of doing it wrong and then uh, now, and then adjusting and doing all that stuff. And so when you have a good uh, team, they've taken their licks in there. You know, Brandon knew everything there was no, to know about web development, partly because he was learning partly because he saw it in action, hey, this web, you know, this backend is not what is most efficient for a client, or this isn't even, maybe this one's great, but they're not going to be able to use it moving forward, you know, those sorts of things that I'm like, that's, he always left me in a, uh, from whenever we talked with something where I was like, that's why you're the man, that's why I use you, because you just said something to me that I didn't know, and I couldn't find on a blog unless if I read it for five or six hours, you know, yeah, that's huge. Like uh, surrounding yourself with the right people and get taking the advice from the right people. That's one of those things. Like, like we said, you're the average of the five people you hang out with the most. And that's why when we drive down to Kenai, it's like, Hey, Jeff, you want to ride with me? Cause <laughs> bounce ideas. that's an hour of some, like Jeff is one of those guys. He's not a, you know, he's not a 20 minute guy. He's like a, he's like a two to three hour guy. You want to get in and talk and listen. And once he goes, he, he's like, allow me to digress. Like he will go down this <laughs> rabbit hole that's like way down there. And you're like, that was awesome. But we were way over here. And I'm like, I'm like, all right, cool. I'm totally into that. <laughs> I just, I talk enough to keep you awake. My poor children know that because if the car ride is five minutes, I'll talk for five minutes. If the car ride is two hours, I'll talk for two hours. So, but I keep the driver awake. <laughs> there you go. Well, and you, you talked about your kids. So you, you just had a, you have a you have you have a family you have a family of three boys right and um, one of the questions because inside this process everybody if you don't know like I don't think of all these questions by myself I literally ask the interviewee 
Like what questions do you kind of want to go over? So if you're writing this down, like I want to do a podcast, you should probably ask, hey, what would you like to talk about? It's one of those really cool things that automatically sends out, you come back and it's like, they're good at this. So you talked about work, work-life balance. And one of the stories that you told me all the time was, one of the stories that you told me that just riveted me was you've been working from home for a long time. You've kind of had your own schedule for a long time. And Jeff literally has like every single year, his son Braden has had a picture of him walking him to school. And there's somewhere, you know, as he gets older, he, he doesn't want to walk with his dad, or <laughs> with his dad, but he, and that like, that was riveting to me. So what he told me one time was he was driving to work and he looked over at Braden and the guy next to him was like freaking out or something. And he looked over at Braden and he says, maybe that guy's day is not going as good as ours. And, and you said it in a way that he could understand, like, make your own time, set your own boundaries. So in like, in a nutshell, like, how do you convey that to someone to create work-life balance, but then pass it on to your, your kids? Like Braden understands that. Yeah, I think, uh, I think work-life balance is such a, um, it's just something that's changed so much uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, because there is so many, you know, entrepreneurs who want to do things, but I really just see two things out in the world where it is older generation kind of bristling at the work-life balance, and then young generation going like, uh, yeah, I have to work a million hours a week to get there to and put everything else on hold in my personal life to do that. And I mean, each to their own. But for me personally, uh, I've had some opportunities that I think I've passed on because it would impact my ability to uh, be at every hockey game for my son or to uh, be able to help at home in a different way with my wife and my younger kids. And so um, I think that the, there's an element of uh, awareness now people like Gary V who like maybe 10 years ago people were like man all that guy does is say we need to work 16 hours a day and so I think he's really worked hard in the last few years to talk about hey this is what I do mm -hmm. this is not what how you have to do it and I also still have a good uh, family life and stuff like that but for me uh, I know that I want to be able to say you know for a while until my son is old you know now he's older brings older I've been to every single game. I've missed one when I, you know, some super sick or something like that. And so I think that's worth a certain amount of money. You know, like I always tell my wife, there's an opportunity here for us to have, uh, you know, to make more money, to do certain things. But that also means sacrificing on this end. And for me personally, I'm just not willing to do that. I still have the time and the support of my wife and kids to work as much as I, I want to and I can. Um, but yeah, I just, that, that experience, like driving down the road, I just remember um, that um, I just remember a, like a guy cutting me off and I'm like, he's late for work. Like that's late for work. If you ever want one reason, like why you want to work for yourself, I want to make sure that I'm on time for meetings that I'm punctual, but I also know I never have that boss. Cause I've had that feeling of walking into a sales meeting three minutes late thinking I might get fired because my boss doesn't understand it's Alaska and it's breakup, you know, just something like that. Something as small as that gives you anxiety when you work for people who aren't qualified to be your boss. So if you want to do that, you know, and that's what I try to tell, you know, Braden, Hey, if there's one singular reason why you want to work for yourself, you know, it obviously is a microcosm of that guy cutting me off, but that's what I think, like make your schedule, still be responsible, still do all the things you need to do to support your family. Um, but you can make your schedule, you know? Yeah, that and and I digress. <laughs> and what I I love that story. Like that was one of those things that like really like riveted me. I I'm the same way. My dad told me my dad was at every single hockey game. Like he was literally hockey practice, hockey game. I remember there's a story that he would pick me up. I made one of the premier all star teams in in the state. I don't know how I did it. I just did it. <laughs> um, but three or four of those those guys went on to play in the NHL. Like that's the top, the top tier of, of, uh, of hockey. And he would pick me up. He actually bought a brand new car. 
a, a blazer. He would pick me up. He put the seat down, and this is the, guys. This is in the eighties. We're allowed to. We were allowed to do this. He put the <laughs> spare tire down, and I would literally get dressed on the way from Muldoon to Dempsey Anderson, which is a fifteen to twenty minute drive. I literally would right. get dressed in my hockey gear all the way over, and it was <laughs> it was like my dad would just give up so much things and it's like that was one of the things that i made a made a promise to all my boys i was like i won't miss i won't miss a game i mean unless i'm if i'm in town i'll be there and i'll work my schedule yeah. around it and i've got i've been lucky enough to have an amazing boss that understands that and you know works around that so that that's huge yeah yeah you talked about family and saying no to things no to projects i mean we just talked about that how do you like, do you have like a filter? Do you, Cause you, I mean, you have a disinfecting company, you, you have a marketing company, you work with a gym, you are at BNI's, you were at all these different things. You play softball, you show up all the time with us and you, you never miss. Is, do you have like a process that you go through? I mean, one of the questions is says when to say yes, when to say no to projects or opportunities. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I don't know if I can distill it down with a filter, but I think it's obviously you have to, my primary thing in any project is who I'm going to be working with. Mm -hmm. Like when I first started my agency, my very first client was uh, somebody who I invited to my wedding that I'm still friends with to this day. I talked to yesterday and it, it just fit like it was much as I was like, okay, I'm a brand new ad agency. I better get a client. I also was interviewing him to see if I'm going to want to work with him and vice versa. And we just clicked and, and that sort of thing where now I was making decisions that uh, financially were my own, my own business, all those things that, you know, I wasn't coming back making, you know, 8% commission at the TV station. Now this was, everything was my own. I wanted to make money obviously, but I wanted to surround myself with people who were positive and who I thought, you know what, I can definitely learn something from them. And, you know, kind of going back to who you surround yourself with when it's come to business, I've been really fortunate to have people and opportunity around me who I'm like, you definitely know more than me. You know a lot more than me. And like I said, even sometimes you've taken some lumps that I don't want to take. And so tell me about that experience. Um, you know, and so I think that I've been fortunate, um, but things I say no to, if I don't see that, it's not even the financial aspect, because honestly, I like taking on projects. We're all here to make money and support our families. I like taking on projects, though, that I just know this is going to be educational for me. I'm still young enough to where I plan on doing this for a long time. And this is going to be a relationship or an educational moment that's going to carry me, you know, through, or, or you know, I'm going to learn something new, which I enjoy doing. And so um, that's been pretty awesome here at the gym at Body Renew. It's same thing. Brian is awesome to work with and has a wealth of knowledge from running this business and other things that I draw on all the time. Um, and that, yeah, that usually, uh, and so that was an opportunity where I was like, you know what, this is a really good business opportunity for me, but it's also something that I can sit here and just soak up all of the knowledge that, uh, that he has. Yeah, that's a big deal because you're, you're getting, it's not free tutelage, but you're getting tutelage. And, and the difference between like making a decision, decision like that, like saying yes to that, because the money is, is good, but also because you're surrounding yourself, you're, you're masterminding every single day. And, you know, some people don't have that. Some people, their mastermind is with Netflix. Their mastermind is with Facebook. Their mastermind is like, like, I, I'm a firm believer of like the block party. Don't put a bunch of stuff up there because I will block you on Facebook. I don't need that. <laughs> funny because I hear that all the time. I'm like, they're like, the, Facebook is so negative. I'm like, where? Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't understand yeah. what you're talking about. Like, I don't, yeah. like it, it just, there's a filter. There's a, bar there's a barrier. Yeah. I, I, and I think that's really important. Um, yeah. It's just really important to be able to surround yourself with positive people, that positive energy. It just lends itself. It just moves itself in the, in the right direction. It always has for me. And, and like you said, there's some people that don't have that, you know, for a long time I did work by myself 
and bouncing ideas off yourself is not the best of uh, ideas, you know? So I've been, I'm really happy to move into kind of what I would consider 2.0 of my agency, where I do have more um, people that I interact with on a more regular basis and things like that, because it's, that is, it's a huge, hugely important thing, whether you're just, you know, sitting at a whiteboard trying to come up with ideas or, um, you know, listening, just honestly listening. I've, uh, tried to become better at that as much as I talk. I've tried to become better at, at just sitting and listening to um, what people who are smarter and have been in it longer than me uh, know. Yeah, I I was listening to something you have two ears and one mouth, but like I like to absorb. I'm a sponge. I just listen, like to listen. That's probably why I like to drive down to Kenai with you because I just like <laughs> to all the time. I want to actually like, com- so my next question is what are you working on and where can people find you? But I actually want you to, to tell me a little bit about, so, you know, awards and accolades are important. They, they make, they make who you are. They, they, sometimes that's people's identity. And I know it's not yours because you've done some crazy marketing stuff. Like you've actually eaten cereal out of your gold pan or something. <laughs> done some I gotta make it useful. Yeah. yeah. So tell me like, that's a big deal to, to win a gold pan award from the chamber of commerce. How is that? changed the way people look at your businesses and the things that you're doing how has that changed has it, has it created that accolade that's super important because i know you kind of brush it off like it's kind of a cool thing but it's you know it's not me but how, how has it changed the business like because i want people to understand that if they build it if they if they write a book if they do a blog if they do something that creates an accolade, creates a prof- creates them as somebody different, and an award like that does create you as somebody different, especially throughout the the uh, the city of Anchorage. How how has that changed your business? Um, sure, I, I think that I was actually thinking about that uh, coming on, and I was like, you know, I, I listen to Gary V all the time, and uh, another guy, uh, Alex Ramosi, and they always just say. They talk a lot about enjoying the process. Like, I really like this story. I just listened to it the other day. And Gary Vaynerchuk, he always talks about Wine Library. When he started Wine Library, he did the, you know, everybody told me he's an idiot. YouTube is not a thing and all that stuff. And he's like, and I told my son this story. I said, he started, he did his first episode. Nobody gave a shit. Nobody cared. He said, nobody cared. And he's like, and then I did a thousand of them which is, you know, over three years. He said, then I did a thousand of them. And guess what? And I was telling my son this story and he's like, then everybody, then he's famous and everybody. He said, no, no one gave a shit. He did a thousand episodes of Wine Library. Still nobody cared, but he didn't care. He liked the process and he had his college buddies and the guys that he grew up in driving up in fancy cars and he would load the wine up and they would be like, oh yeah, Gary's loading the wine up but he didn't care because he enjoyed the process. And so I think the gold pan was amazing, a huge honor and, you know, love the chamber, love all the people that I've been able to network with, which um, in the last year and a half to two years, I've made my force myself to do more things like that. Um, And I like that, but I also think I have, I like the process, like building the website for the business was fun. You know, doing all of those things, seeing a first client, doing the things that made us successful. Like I enjoyed those things almost as much as I enjoyed winning the gold pin because it's just that process. And I think, you know, you obviously don't get one without the other. And th- and that's kind of the takeaways that you have to, you know, for softball, you, you know, you have to get to first to get to home. That process to get to first is still just as important. And so in business, same thing, setting all that stuff up, making sure that you're networking, making sure that your clients are happy and all of those things um, led to that. And um, yeah, I would say it's, you know, given us obviously more name recognition and stuff like that, which is really cool. Uh, like you said, that's not like I hang it right here in my office or anything. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a really, it was a really big honor. Like you said, other great businesses and, and you know, thanks to the chamber for that, for sure. Well, yeah, when you, when you won that, I was like, you know what? I got to get Jeff on the podcast. It was like a big deal because he, but you, you downplayed it. It was so cool. You downplayed it because you're so humble and and that's, that's just who you are. So I'm going to ask you two more questions and I'm going to let you go. Um, This question, you know, is a little bit, this is not business or it is business, but it's, it's more of, I want you to kind of future cast. Um, I'm going to actually put, you know, how people can find you and what you're working on inside the show notes. So 
if you guys want to meet with Jeff or listen to Jeff or chat with Jeff or follow him on Facebook, then we'll put all that information in there so you guys can, can chat with him. Um, but, you know, I, I was reading the book by Tony Robbins, Master the Money, and he asked all of these investment gurus from like Charles Schwab to Ray Dalio to all of these like big names. He asked him a question similar to this, but I want to kind of ask you it because it's important to kind of future cast, you know, what you would do. What would, what would, what would Jeff do? So as a father, a husband, and a really cool dad that shows up to all the games, not being able to pass down money to your family and only a concept for life or business, what would that look like? Yeah, bummer. I was going to do the money. No, um, I think it's, it's somewhere in that conversation about uh, work-life balance. I wish I had, uh, you know, two sentences that everyone could go like write down or tattoo on their body that were brilliant. I don't, I just think that it's, you know, what I endeavor to do with my business is for my children to see that I am responsible and that I take the time to make sure that my clients uh, are taken care of and that work is done and that I'm successful, but that I'm just as successful and invested in my family. And like I said earlier, I think that the older generation can bristle a little bit about uh, what that looks like. Um, and I just don't want that to ever be the conflict. You know, it's, it is a, a, a balance, delicate balance still with m my family, but I want it to be that um, the two things run in unison almost. They, you know, like I, I love what I do. And I used to say when I worked at the TV station, I used to say, hey, 40 hours a week is a long time to be away from your family. You better enjoy what you do, you know, whether that be with who you work with or what you actually do. And if you don't, do something else. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that people understand that they can now. They can. There's so many avenues to doing that where before it's like, I got to put my resume together and okay, I guess I won't work at this TV station. I'll work at another TV station or a radio station. It's not like that. Like literally sit down and go, what would I, you know, what do I enjoy doing? And so I was listening a couple of weeks ago and I think it was Steve Jobs. He just said at a commencement speech, he said, um, I live, you know, I, I live every day. Like it was my last day because one day it will be. And he's like, if I, he's like, that's how I've lived the last 30 years. This is what he said. He's like, I, I live every day like it's my last day. And if I ever get bored or don't feel like I'm living like my last day, after about seven or eight days, I change something. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about that and I was like, what would my last day look like if I, if I knew it? And I would still go to work because it's important for my children to know that work is important and that you take care of your family and that's what you do. But I've started to craft that a little bit more in my head is like, Live every day like your last day. That's a high expectation. But if it were even close to that, I wouldn't get home and be tired. I would still play ball. I would still, you know, roll around with my kids and do all that stuff. So that's where I think, digressing as I do, that's where I think that, like, if I could leave something to my kids, I want them to see that when I get home, I might be tired from work, but I enjoyed it. My kids, you know, again, I'm very fortunate, especially here at Body Renew. My kids come into the office. They play with Brian. They know the people that work here. Like I'm able to do that where before I would bring my kids to the TV station, but I would make sure that they were quiet and that they sat in the corner and that the boss didn't see them and all of those things. Now they have a different view of life that I didn't have growing up where I'm like, I'm not going to work with my dad and I don't even know my dad's boss. And I, yeah, maybe he likes his job. He doesn't really talk about it a lot. You know, I, uh, to my wife's chagrin, sometimes talk about my job a lot. I talk about marketing a lot. And so I, I just hope that they see that you can enjoy what you do. I mean, that would be it, it distilled down. You can enjoy what you do and it doesn't have to be getting home and being like, man, my boss is such a jerk or man, you know, and everything's not roses and sunshine for me every day. I'm just saying that's what I would hope that they can. You know, I know people in our peer group, you and I, and in our own peer group that are um, paralyzed by the idea of changing or doing anything that's not in the eight to five. I have a boss. I get a paycheck. I, you know, that sort of thing. And I just don't, that box is just so narrow to me that I, I would be, unless if my kids really love that, 
I'd be really disappointed if all my kids go and punch a time clock for work, because I think that there's just so much that you can do. And I mean, I do social, I, mean, I do digital marketing, you know, I, I, I do a few other things, sales and marketing. So it's not like, um, it's not some soapbox to save the world, but I also say my very first client was like the premier, uh, cancer detection center in Alaska. And so when my son asks me what I do for work, I said, I save lives. And he's like, what? You do social media? And I said, no, I make sure that people can see early awareness and cancer detection. It gives me goosebumps when I say it. I mean, still, because I'm like, I know I do social media. I know I do advertising. I help people get to this point and I save lives. And that's pretty cool. And so I think that that's where when you can understand it, whether you're the receptionist at a job or whatever your job is, that you actually have that impact on people and you stop going like, I'm just a receptionist here. I'm just a, like, that's really cool. And so I, I hope that my kids can see just some dumb entrepreneur sales guy. I can actually say that, that they can have the ability to impact the world because that's really what you can do. Dude. That's the mic. That, was the, that was the <laughs> mic drop. Can you see why when we go on these? So every 4th of July, we actually go down for a tournament. And I'm always like, Jeff, you want to ride with me? He's always like, I want to ride with you. So I, I'm looking forward to the next one. We'll, we'll, we'll go and we'll, we'll do another one of these. But I could spend hours with you and just kind of chat marketing and kind of do, do all this stuff. But man, that was an amazing interview. And one thing that, that, you, that you pulled, the nugget is like, just it's not just enjoy what you do, but it's actually embody what you do. Like when you said that you help, like you're a part of that in their marketing. So right. for all the entre entrepreneurs out there, everyone that you're helping, you're a part of moving them to the next thing. You're a part of saving lives. You're a part of helping them find a, uh, you know, VBRO, you're, a, you're credit repair, whatever you're helping people with. Like embody that yeah. because once you start to embody that, you start to share. Once you start to share that, you start to own it. Once you start to own it, then it's yours. Yeah. And what happens is sales become easy. Marketing becomes easy, just like it has with Jeff. So Jeff, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you again. Like we'll, we'll chat for sure later guys. And remember to listen to the full outro. We'll put uh, links to Jeff's information in the show notes so you can connect with Jeff because like I said, one of the most amazing marketing minds that I get to like chat with face to face is, is sitting in that chair across from you guys. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you doing this and be sure to listen to the show note. I mean, be sure to listen to the outro and we will catch you on the next episode of Burnt Phone Marketing Radio. Thanks a lot. Are you tired of those lame Facebook groups that provide no value? Well, our Facebook group is awesome. Go to unlocktheFBgroup.com and get access to our Facebook group where you will be able to find interviews of top network marketers and Q&As where you can jump in and talk to them live. We also have massive training. We provide a bunch of free tools. So jump into that group. Again, that's unlock the fbgroup.com we'll ask you a few questions in mini chat because that's what we do and make sure that you're not a spammer and get you into the group right away so again go to unlock the fbgroup.com and don't be a spammer